During my ATP CTP class experience, far and away, the full motion simulator was by far the coolest thing. The rest of the class was really great too, so I thought I'd share here what happens at an ATP CTP class at Delta Airlines. I won't go into all the requirements, but if you want to fly transport category aircraft, these days you have to take what's called an ATP CTP class. Taking and passing that class enables you to take the ATM, the Airline Transport Multi-Engine, written exam. And after that, then you're eligible to take the ATP checkride. So being from the Atlanta area and with Delta Airlines being here in Atlanta, it made a lot of sense for me to take a ATP CTP class here locally. I'll go through each day and what we did, but overall, the people that I interfaced with, the three different instructors I had, the people that were in the class, it was fantastic. It was really cool for somebody like me coming from a, you know, a, a single engine background to learn about the transport category. And what does that mean? What does it mean to fly jets? All right, so let's go through each of the days. Day one was about air carrier operations. And what does that mean in the life of a airline pilot? We hit topics like physiology, uh, fitness for flight, the different types of health issues or hazards that um, airline pilots need to be aware of. There was a big emphasis on high altitude operations and oxygen requirements and of course we talked about fatigue and what does it mean to be a commuting pilot commuting to your base in another city and the effect that might have on you and what are the regulations around something like commuting another topic for day one was communication things like pdc pre-departure clearance cpdlc controller pilot data link communications and other ways that you might communicate with your company we also talk about checklists operational control dispatch and the interface between pilots and dispatch, which is amazing, by the way. We also talked about equipment, MELs and CELs, that's minimum equipment lists and configuration deviation lists, and what to do if there is an issue with uh, equipment on your airplane. Next, we covered ground operations, that's taxiing, uh, ramp procedures, runway incursion avoidance, airport situational awareness, briefings, hotspots, and other topics like low visibility operations, which we'll talk about later. So that's a lot for day one. And real quick, if you like this content, I'd really appreciate a touch and go on the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you. Okay, day two started with knowledge and content around turbine engines. We talked about monitoring, the different types of malfunctions that you might have to deal with, the different issues with starts or uh, compressor stalls. Next, we got into performance of the turbine aircraft, the V1, VR, V2 speeds, rudder usage, and what does that really mean in a larger aircraft? And it's very different th than what you might have learned in your single engine airplane, what different configurations of the airplane would do in a takeoff scenario uh, with both or one engine. That might be flap settings or um, anti-ice equipment as it turned on or off. We talked a lot about automation during day two, the autopilot, the flight director, the FMS, all the things that make flying a bigger airplane easier on the pilot, but what also what are the, the critical pitfalls that may happen with over-reliance upon automation. We also cover GPS, LNAV, VNAV, RMP, uh, different operational specs that the airlines typically use with their automation capabilities. And of course, ADS-B, TCAS, and TOS. I'll just say just the amount of automation that's available is such a safety enhancement. It's amazing. As long as you know how to use the automation, then it can be your best friend. The last topic for day two was around meteorology and weather and what are the things that air carriers have to deal with. And those are things like turbulence or icing, wind shear, crosswind, different braking actions depending on the surface of the runways. We talked about SMIGs, which is basically low visibility operations at an airport and how do you get around an airport on the ground if you can't see anything. And then we finished up with CAT 2 and CAT 3 instrument approaches. Day 3 started with, what does it really feel like to be an airline pilot on a day-to-day -day basis? And that's considering things like, you know, how do you bid? What does it mean to hold a reserve line or a regular line? Types of reserve that you could be on and, and the requirements to be at or near the airport within a certain amount of time. Some real-world strategies on how to increase your pay. And that may be by picking up trips that other people don't want or perhaps on holidays, anything to get your pay to be double for that trip is a great way to increase your income. CRM and leadership was a theme throughout, and we really dove into it deep on day three. And on day three and every other day, we watched scenarios of real world accidents or incidents that had happened 
and the lesson learned from those incidents. Some of them, for example, in the CRM showed some really poor examples of CRM and other situations that showed great CRM, like the United Airlines flight that landed in Sioux City with uh, basically no flight controls. That showed great CRM and how it did save lives. CRM really means it's not just you and your your first officer flying, figuring out what's going on. You've got yourself, you've got your cabin crew, you've got your company, you've got ATC. There's so many ways to remedy a situation by using all the information that's available to you. One of the things I didn't know that I thought was pretty cool to find out is that when there is an emergency with an air carrier, typically, at least this is what our instructor told us, is that the first officer is going to become the pilot flying and talking to ATC while the captain would then turn into the pilot monitoring, but is the one really working the emergency and talking to company and going through checklists. The goal for both those pilots is to make sure that each of them are doing what needs to be done in that scenario. We did look at some examples where the pilot flying got so engrossed in flying the airplane and the pilot monitoring got so engrossed in having their head in a checklist that they didn't agree with what was happening in the situation. So that's first and foremost, if effective flight path management is making sure that the captain and the first officer are on the same page and they both agree what the problem is, the solution is, discuss any obstacles or disagreements and come up with a, a unified plan of action. We also learned about how important the cabin crew is as part of CRM, uh, making sure that the not only the cabin crew is informed, but the passengers are informed as well with what's going on. Kind of a rule of thumb we learned was uh, in an emergency, uh, when it comes to communication, you're going to make two calls out and two calls in. The two calls out would be to ATC and to your company, and the two calls in would be to your cabin crew and then a PA to the passengers. It's also cool to learn how the flight deck crew communicates with the cabin crew in a uh, emergency type situation. And they used a Delta, the TTSR method type of emergency. It may be a red, yellow, or perhaps a medical emergency. The next T is for time. How much time do you have to prepare for this emergency? S is special instructions. Any instructions the cabin crew might need to, to have or to give to passengers. And finally, R is repeat it back to me to make sure that the cabin crew knows and agrees with what the flight deck crew is saying. So they have those instructions repeated back to whoever gave the instructions. We studied the acronym SALAD of voluntary safety programs, including ASRS, ASAP, FOQA, LOSA, and SMS. Day three continued with discussions around aerodynamics. Without a healthy knowledge around aerodynamics, you can get yourself into a bad situation. And that's what happened on Pinnacle 37 of Wall, which we spent a lot of time talking about. And the summary there is our captain and first officer took an empty plane that they were repositioning, and they decided to test the limits of how, of the service ceiling of the airplane. So they ended up having such a high angle of attack, both the engine explained out, cooled down and core locked, and there was no recovery possible. That led us to talk about Coffin Corner, which is really being between exceeding your critical angle of attack and a stall and being so close and almost exceeding the mock induced buffeting airspeed which would cause instability in an airplane and through our simulation later in the week we were able to see how close you can be between that stall number and that critical mock number we did talk a lot about mock and mock speeds and why getting above critical mock in in a transport airplane is such a bad idea learned about the mock buffet and fluttering tendencies in those swept back wing airplanes. And we also learned potential stall scenario. You get the stick shaker, stick pusher, but in a exceeding that critical mock number, you get a clacker that happens. So the pilots are certainly aware if they are going to exceed that critical mock number. And then the discussion went to turbulence. And really a lot of that was around, you know, predicting turbulence and using company resources to determine where turbulence is going to be Throughout the training, but really in day four, the upset recovery technique of push, roll, power, stabilize really was drilled into all of our our heads on how important that is. We looked at several cases where pilots really just forgot those basic stick and rudder type skills when they're in a stall that they need to push. Uh, Air France was certainly an example of that where they were basically in a stall all the way down to the ocean, and uh, we know that didn't work out. That expanded envelope training, um, we would certainly cover that later in the simulators, which I'll talk about, but that 
upset recovery technique, having that really ingrained in what you do as an automatic uh, response to an upset recovery situation was really hammered hard. And before we talk about the simulator, what happened there, Delta did a great job bringing in different guest speakers, people with different um, areas of expertise within the company to talk about what I'd say probably those had three different speakers. Those were probably the highlight of uh, much of the training is just getting that insider real world knowledge of what it's like to be in, be at an airline. Another interesting thing about the class, there's 14 of us in this class and 11 of the pilots were military, military pilots. There were three of us civilian pilots and uh, only two of us didn't have any turbine time at all. So it was a little intimidating at first going in thinking, um, you know, all these folks know so much about jets and turbines and how, and how they work. And, um, but really everybody was very humble and there to learn. And there's things that, you know, I certainly learned from talking to the military pilots and how they do things. And some of the military pilots were even curious about, you know, how do I go about getting checked out in the 172? So uh, we traded information and uh, camaraderie was really good. We each were assigned a simulator partner. Uh, my guy was a former um, KC-135 pilot. He got lucky. He got me the you know, the single engine pilot. But despite our experience differences, uh, the simulator time was amazing. I think for us both, um, our simulator instructor prepped us before each session on what we're going to do, uh, the procedures around it. We weren't there to show proficiency in all these things, but really just to get exposed to it, which was, which was cool. There was no pressure to, you know, make sure that you did this V1 cut takeoff exactly perfectly. It was more about the exposure. My simulator was the Airbus uh, 220, which is a really fun airplane. So I hear from other pilots to fly and the simulator was no different. It was, it was, it was, it was really cool. From stepping in the simulator from, you know, start to finish, we went through what is it really like when you arrive at your gate to your airplane, um, to check out the maintenance logs and the airworthiness to get your weight data record from dispatch, uh, make sure all your numbers are good. We went through, you know, using operating the FMS and how important that is to make sure everything is set up just like you want it with all the numbers. We learned how to communicate with dispatch and ATC with really through computer uh, and not through voice. In the simulator and in the classroom, when we really talk about performance and all the numbers and the airspeeds, it's all built around one engine operation. I mean, the airlines and, and air carriers are locked and loaded, ready to fly on one engine. And that's what they're guaranteeing performance is that if they lose, lose an engine, all the numbers we got for like takeoff distances or flap settings were based upon what happens if you lose an engine at the most critical time. So there's so much safety built into uh, air carrier operations. It's really phenomenal. Each lesson in the simulator was very specific, but some of the things just in general that we covered um, is use of auto brakes and auto throttle, auto land and autopilot. All that automation, uh, you know, within the FMS and F flight director is really crucial that you know that because so much of your operation uh, likely will be using that automation. We did the SMIGS taxi, you know, the taxiing with uh, basically no visibility. We also learned to use the tiller and how that's used on the captain's side to, um, to, to turn the airplane on the ground. We did lots of approaches uh, with auto land and without auto land. Auto throttle to me was like one of the coolest things is that once you're on approach and you've set your V rest speed plus five, the airplane's going to hold that. And your job is just to keep it aligned with the runway and then flare at appropriate time. That was amazing. We talked about crosswinds a lot and, you know, in the GA world, or if you're a tailwheel uh, pilot, you know, you know, you're going to uh, use a cross control uh, method to align yourself with the runway. So you land straight. Well, that usually means, you know, a wing low method. Well, you can't do that in a airplane with a big giant engine hanging off the wing. So uh, in the airline or air carrier world, the preferred method is the crab and kick. Uh, we certainly practice that where we're, we have a crosswind or crabbed and right at the end, uh, you kick in rudder to align yourself with the runway. Rudder usage was also something that was really interesting to learn about in that the airlines really, the rudder is only used for a couple situations. Um, it's not for doing the coordinated steep turns. No, it's more for uh, directional control on the ground, on landing rollout or takeoff, really keeping the airplane on the runway. And it really is most important in one engine operations. Other than that, there's just not a lot of attention paid to uh, her usage or coordination. We practiced the TCAS scenarios or events, TAs and the RAs. Uh, we had a couple of airplanes 
come at us and the uh, TCAS tells you exactly what to do and you, then uh, the conflict will be avoided. Then talk, tell ATC what happened. We also had a TAWS or a ground proximity warning uh, system simulation where basically we're pointed at a mountain and didn't do anything until, you know, the last minute. And the airplane, believe me, is telling you, you need to do something. You know, we did an escape or evasion maneuver away from uh, terrain that was going to be a problem. We also covered several emergency type procedures, one being a, a critical situation where you may have an unreliable ice airspeed indication. Unreliable airspeed has caused airplanes to um, or pilots to, to not be able to fly because they're so focused on airspeed and not knowing how to fly the airplane without airspeed. Certainly it's important um, to have airspeed, but what do you do if that does happen? Um, and it's kind of unsettling because, at least in the simulator, you you just can't tell how fast you're going like you maybe could feel in a, in a, a Piper Warrior. Another emergency event we practiced was the uh, rapid decompression event, you know, being up at 35,000 feet and, you know, having all the, your, you lose your cabin pressurization. Get your mask on. At, po- at that point, the automation really takes over uh, the, the autopilot recognizes the event and puts you in a descent to get you down, um, you know, to 10,000 feet as quickly as possible. There were several case studies we looked at where uh, pilots did not get their mask on or it, was a, or it was a deep compression that just was very slow and not rapid where pilots lost consciousness and um, that obviously didn't turn out well. Wind shear avoidance and detection, we went over that. Sim partner had to take off right basically into a, a thunderstorm and perform a uh, wind shear escape technique, which was, uh, you know, it was pretty intense. So the training is definitely hard there. Um, and certainly one of the things we learned about wind shear avoidance is just to avoid it, right? Uh, use the tools that you have on board and ATC and any comf- company information to just stay on the ground and not take off into a wind shear um, laden environment. We went over high altitude stalls, high altitude performance, um, maneuverability of the airplane. And with automation on, the airplane is trying so hard to keep flying like it does not want to stall it doesn't want you to stall um our sim instructor was able to turn some of that off so we could see and i guess feel what it is like to um enter a stall in a a big airplane the recovery push roll power stabilize that they drilled into us i had an unusual attitude where we're basically pointed you know 35 degrees nose down airspeed increasing and you still have to go through the same four push roll power stabilize uh, to get control of the airplane. It doesn't happen, you know, that quickly. I mean, it's a big airplane with a lot of uh, inertia and momentum. So you have to be deliberate and predictable about your response to an upset recovery uh, situation. Did a Cat 3 auto land coming in back into Atlanta uh, on autopilot? Obviously, it, it was cool. It's amazing to see how, how great the technology is and how safe it is that you can land with such poor visibility. We also did what's called a V1 cut, which is basically you're taking off at V1, there's an issue, and you immediately pull power back. Usually the captain's job, reject the, the takeoff. The difference between V1, VR, your rotate speed, is usually pretty close. So once you pass uh, V1, you're committed to taking off. We did a full flight from Atlanta to Charlotte, gate to gate. Uh, we did some flying out in the Salt Lake City area and Seattle, Washington area. One of the cool things that we also did was uh, the river approach into Reagan National, DCA, into runway 19 er uh, it's really cool to see both hand flying and with autopilot how precise you have to be to fly that approach because you're so low to the ground and the airspace, as we know, is just so restricted or prohibited in that area that you really can't make any mistakes there or you're going to get violated. We also did a flight from Atlanta, took off and then had an issue and had to divert um, and ended up doing an arrival back to Atlanta and uh, landing safely there. A lot of the focus really was on CRM um, and making sure that the pilot flying knew their duties and the pilot monitoring knew their duties and that they cross-checked each other, that uh, there was never any question on the flight deck on who was doing what. And that took a little bit to get used to. You know, I'm used to flying really in a single pilot, and it really just makes you feel like, uh, you know, you're backed up with everything you do and that you get to back up somebody on everything they do, so fewer mistakes are going to get made. We did some rejected takeoffs uh, with one engine, so we basically lost an engine before V1, and my sim partner got one with a dry runway. He was able to stop the airplane, use rudder to maintain directional control, and all was well. For my rejected uh, takeoff, the sim instructor said, hey, you, it's going to be a icy runway. No matter what you do, you're not going to be able to keep it on the runway. So I, I took that, I guess, with a grain of salt, and he killed an engine, you know, about 80 knots on our IC runway, and 
there was nothing I could do, rudder, brake, uh, any steering to keep uh, the, the airplane on the runway. But really emphasizes what a critical phase of flight uh, takeoff is. We also got to exercise like the, I guess, some of the limits of the airplane just to see, you know, the maneuverability and the stability of the airplane um, at different altitudes and what the performance would be like if we were to do some steep banking or high uh, rate climbs or descents. The passengers in the back, I'm sure not, would not love that. So that's why we don't do it. But does need to see what that airplane could actually do. Through all this, after you do your training, you get signed off, you get your graduation certificate, and then you can take the ATP uh, written exam. And from that, you can go on and get your ATP check ride done. For me, this course made sense because it's in my backyard. I didn't have to pay for travel and hotels. The Delta and Delta Professional Services course is a little bit more expensive than some of the other courses I looked at. But far and away, I would recommend this to anybody that could take it. It was just so first class and professional and real world. There are just so many great stories. The three instructors that we had, they all were former line pilots. So they had so many good stories of real world situations that they were either in or saw and how all the things that we learned throughout the class absolutely applied. One of the things we did talk about was bird strike uh, risks and avoidance. And I actually made a video about that and I'll put that up here. Uh, thanks for watching. Stay flying, everybody.